All right. So, yes, as Emma said, I'm going to give you a basic introduction to studying law generally and studying law at Oxford in particular. Now, um, the uh, intro video from the Dean was fantastic because it's just sort of uh, encapsulated in a nutshell some of the things I'm going to say. I'll amplify a few of them, um, but I'll try and go through reasonably quickly to give people more time for to ask questions at the end. Um, as uh, Emma said, um, I am the Access and Outreach Quarter at the faculty. I'm also an Associate Professor of Civil Procedure and I'm a fellow at Mansfield College. Um, and again, I just want to reiterate something that, that the Dean said, which is in, in terms of diversity, one of my roles at Oxford as Access and Outreach Quarter is to make sure we get the very brightest minds from, from, the, from all backgrounds, no matter where you're from, uh, no matter what your opportunities you've had, um, great or small, um, we know that, uh, that talent is uh, evenly distributed amongst the population and we're keen to find it wherever it is. And that's why um, uh, access uh, outreach initiatives like this are extremely important because we want to have a communication directly with you, albeit in, on Zoom in this rubbish COVID world, um, to tell you about uh, how we do things at Oxford and try and get you excited and, and interested in applying. Um, so why study law? Um, so I have to give you a boring technical explanation and also a slightly more entertaining one. The technical explanation is about the regulatory requirements. Um, and they're slightly complicated by the type of lawyer you, you, you would contemplate or you're interested in becoming in England. The legal profession is split into two branches, barristers and solicitors. Now, um, solicitors are essentially the people who manage the files, manage the case for a particular client. They're, they're the people who, who deal with the client, help the client through all stages of their legal problem, help them formulate a case if they're going to court, help them negotiate a settlement if they're trying to resolve it. Um, they're sort of the, the, the project, the legal project managers um, for uh, the client. Barristers, on the other hand, are the people who wear those funny wigs and costumes and the ones who typically appear in court doing all the advocacy, all the stuff you see on TV, um, uh, the cross-examination, uh, the, the addresses to the, to the juries, the addresses to the court, um, it's quite a quite a, a glamorous uh, profession to be in, um, but you do have, well, uh, in, at least in some courts, you still, still have to wear those funny wigs as well. Um, there are different regulatory requirements um, if you, for being a barrister and solicitor um, and slightly different routes to getting there. You will be the very first cohort um, who doesn't actually have to study a law degree in order to become a solicitor. You don't have to study a law degree at any stage of your um, careers. So the, the Solicitor Regulatory Authority is about to move to essentially what we call the Californian model, whereby anyone can sit the solicitor's qualifying exam in order to become a solicitor. And if you pass and you then go on to do some effectively some, some practical training, um, you can go on to um, practice as a solicitor. It's not um, completely open to everyone. So you can't just be a delivery driver or a Uber driver or a, you know, a, a, a waiter in a cafe and then sit the exam. You have to at least have a degree, but it doesn't matter what subject that degree is in. You, you could do the sciences, you could do history. Um, you don't have to do law. So why would you do law if that's exactly what you want to do? Two reasons. One, because it will be really helpful revision for that solicitor's qualifying exam. Um, you're not going to get helpful revision for that exam studying um, medieval history or chemistry. Um, you want to know um, you want to know the legal rules and the legal procedures that are going to be the subject of that exam in order to pass it. And a law degree is clearly the best way of, of, of getting to that. Secondly, Having a law degree also gets you through the gets you into the networks that are helpful for getting jobs. Um, it gets you exposure to um, the various uh, law firms, uh, get, helps you get work experience, helps you get uh, references from the, your tutors, all of which will be helpful, not necessary, but helpful in order to you to um, 
start making contacts in the profession if that's where you want to head. Now, if you wish to be a barrister, if you're keen on being the person in court doing the arguing, you just love arguing and you want to keep on doing it until, until you retire, um, then you do have to do a law degree. So um, it's, it's important to actually have to do law, either at undergraduate level or a conversion course. There's still the option of doing a first degree in something other than law and then what we call an, another year of legal, tra um, uh, legal training in the form of a conversion course before you then go on to sit a bar exam uh, and do the bar training courses. So the routes are slightly different depending on, on whether you want to be a solicitor or a barrister. Uh, that's something you should bear in mind. Uh, but equally, doing a law degree keeps all your doors open. It keeps all your doors open for being a solicitor, being a barrister, or doing none of those things. Um, you could be an academic. You could do something completely unrelated to law. Um, one of the great things about law is it gives you very transferable skills that you can use um, in all other walks of life. Um, lots of people go into politics. Lots of people who do law go into business and finance. Uh, they go. They might go into the entertainment industry. Um, there's simply no shortage of things that you can do with a law degree. Um, it get really useful skills in terms of how to how to write, how to present yourself uh, in, with succinct arguments, how to get on top of material is extremely helpful uh, skill to learn. Um, we even at a very um, early stage of your degree when you're just um, learning with a, a large number of, of cases, we will teach you how to navigate through those cases and look for the important passages, look for the things that really matter. Um, not every word is, is equally important in law. It's not the Bible, it's not, um, it's not Shakespeare. And, and that's a, digesting that material and analyzing it is, is a skill we will teach you. And we're always making important fine logical distinctions because law is about values-based reasoning. But it's value-based reasoning in a, in a very practical context. And as Minnie said at the start, as a consequence, we are often dealing with um, quite different ways of thinking in the context of, of thinking about legal rules. So we, on the one hand, we're thinking like moral philosophers about what's fair, what's just, in terms of uh, working out what should be right and wrong. But the other end of the spectrum, we're also thinking about economists and behavioral psychologists, because we want to know how people will behave and respond to particular rules. Will, it, will these particular legal rules have their intended effect? Could they have unintended consequences? How do we get people to comply with particular legal rules? So a whole range of different disciplines or different considerations apply to being thinking about law, um, either as lawmakers or people who have to um, litigate uh, cases through the courts. Um, Okay, moving on. Why study law at Oxford? It's a fantastic institution. You've got some of the best academics in the world teaching you in extremely small groups, um, one, two, three uh, students at a time. Um, it's like the opportunity to play football with um, players at Manchester United on a you know less than less than a five-a-side basis, um, and you do it week after week after week after week, and that's slightly intimidating at first. But you get used to it because um, it's those sort of small inter uh, small group interactions that help you navigate all the material and um, refine your thinking about legal problems uh, as you go through the different subjects on the course. Um, the other point I would make is that, um, according to the last rankings that came out last year, on every indicator that matters to you, uh, teaching satisfaction, graduate employability, graduate salaries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And also the indicators that probably don't even matter to you, research impact, um, uh, uh, international reputation, et cetera. All these things, we came first. Um, that's not to say that there aren't other great universities out there. It's not to say that Cambridge isn't also a good university, but in all the things that matter, to you know, even all the things that don't, Oxford is the place to pick. Oxford's the place to be. Um, so, yeah that I'll, I'll, I'll stop picking on Cambridge and I'll come back to explain why that matters when it comes to applying to which particular, which, choosing which particular university you wish to apply to. Myths about us, um, 
it's more expensive than other universities? Uh, no, because the fee structure is capped, it's regulated at, at national level. Um, there will be some variation in the fees because um, some universities can charge lower fees, but the, but the fees are capped at, at the higher, higher end. So I don't know whether you're going to Oxford or some other university studying law, it will um, uh, be a very similar uh, figure. And I think at the moment it's, it's, it's capped at about 9,000 pounds a year. There are also extensive bursary um, schemes and financial support available to you uh, if you need financial support in order to get through your degrees and pay for your fees and also pay for your living expenses while you're in Oxford. Um, I'm not the best person to ask about that, but we will have um, sessions on course um, today um, that will help you um, uh, get across the detail about what financial support is, is out there for you. Um, another myth, people um, from state schools are in the minority. Um, that is definitely not the case. Uh, people from state schools are, are well and truly in the majority. Um, and um, our diverse, the diversity of the student intake has been increasing uh, every year for um, quite a long time now. Um, now that's not to say we're, we're only interested in people from state school students, we're interested in people from all backgrounds. So we also have a significant number of independent school students and also uh, overseas students. We're trying, we, we are, we're not interested in your background, we're interested in your ability to think. And we know that, um, as I said before, talent is everywhere. So we're just trying to find it. And we're looking in, in all corners, in elite schools, in comprehensive schools, uh, overseas schools. We know it's out there and it's in part of the application process. We're looking to find that talent. So um, you can be rest assured that we're, we're just as interested in finding you as you are in finding us. Um, Right, it's about Oxford. It all depends on what college you apply to. Uh, no, it doesn't. We are a federal system. Uh, you, you do apply to a college or you can make an open offer if you want. I'll come to explain um, the, the choices you, you can have. But when we consider your, when Oxford considers your application, the, the colleges cooperate very closely before and after interviews to ensure that the best candidates get in no matter what college they apply to. The point I do wanna make about the college system, um, is that it is, you know, particularly if you're, uh, it's, it's reasonably uh, unique in the uh, uh, English system, is that we effectively have a federal university. We have a central university and uh, in, in law, 30, 30 colleges offering the subject. Now, for those of you who've done politics, you know, at, at high school or even just watch on TV, you'll know that federal systems have their strengths and they have their weaknesses. Um, and often the strengths and the weaknesses are the same thing. Because you have 30 different colleges, you end up with small variations in the way in which colleges do things. Um, in the same way you look at the United States as another well-known um, federal system, and you have uh, variations between what life is like in New York and what life is like in Mississippi or Alabama. Now, I'm not for a moment comparing Oxford with the United States. Um, we have not, fought civil wars with each other. Colleges have never gone to war with each other. Um, there was a civil war fought in Oxford. You'll find out all about it when you come here, you find about the interesting geography, um, why um, uh, North Parade is actually further south than the South Parade. It has to do with where the various forces got to in their battles during the civil war. Um, but the, the, the differences are nowhere near as stark as they are in, for example, a, a federal political union like the United States. But there are significant variations. There's significant variation in the colleges in the, in the size, uh, atmosphere sometimes. Sometimes some, some colleges are extremely old. Some colleges are, are very new. Um, and there are also small variations in terms of um, the kinds of uh, extracurricular activities particular colleges focus on. Uh, the sorts of, the sort of culture at places. Um, I think you, you saw the, the um, the the video from the dean talking about how great it was to be a nerd at Oxford. Now, I would say that 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 Mindy is from a college that tends to be well known for being a nerdy college, and that's not to say that there aren't nerdies nerds all over Oxford. There definitely are, 
Um, but the key point is, is that um, if you are a nerd, you are definitely welcome to Oxford. But equally, if you're not a nerd, there's plenty of people like you uh, at Oxford who are also flourishing. Um, key point I want to make is that whatever, whatever kind of person you are, whatever you're into, you will find like-minded souls at Oxford and you'll find them across the colleges. That said, I do encourage you to do as much research as possible about the colleges because you, while you can do an open application, I've always found that blind dates were never as fun as, as the ones where you knew, knew what you were getting into. And the college of life is one of the great things about Oxford. You get to choose what, what, what kind of college you, you want to look for. The colleges that are small, colleges that are big, colleges that are old, colleges that are new. You get to make those choices when you're making the application. Um, and just, just, just to be clear, if anyone, if everyone wants the Harry Potter experience, you know, with the, with the gowns and the formal dinners, that's the one thing you will get at every college. So don't worry, um, no matter what college you apply to, you're still going to get that kind of quintessential Oxford experience. Okay. And to prove my point, there's lots of people with quintessential Oxford, um, uh, costumes. We've also got um, pretty good facilities. Um, most of them more modern uh, uh, than you would expect, um, both sporting, uh, library facilities, uh, the Bodden Library is a, a very modern building, uh, fantastic holdings, both in person and online. So it's a real mixture of the old and the new. Truth about Oxford is what you make of it. Of course, that's true of everything in life. We pride ourselves and we strive for having law students from all kinds of nationalities and all kinds of backgrounds. There is no typical Oxford student, but we do look for students with academic potential and a love of learning. That's the main thing we're, we're interested in. We want people who really want to be here, not in some pathway to some other position, but because of a love of learning and a love, uh, an eagerness to get under the bonnet of the subject they're, they're teaching, is it they're, sorry, studying to sort of understand how it ticks, understand what's what their, the key questions they have to get on top of. Okay, just about the course content. Um, just very briefly, we split our degree into two um, phases. The first phase, I think you could, it's roughly equivalent to essentially driving on your old plates. We call it moderations, and, and, and it's the first two terms of your degree where we introduce you to some foundational subjects, criminal law, constitutional law, and Roman law. And at the end of those two terms, you set an exam um, on those three subjects. And that's quite early on in your degree, your degree but I can, I can safely say that um, everyone gets through those moderations, provided they try. Um, uh, it's basically just a way of ensure, um, introducing you to these key, key topics and giving you the confidence that you know what you're doing and to be able to move on to the next phase, which is essentially what we've got down the right-hand column, the final honor, final honor school. Um, and it's that final honor school with, where we do over two and a half years that counts towards your final degree, your final mark classification. The moderations is essentially um, you know, the, the old plate getting through the probation period. Um, you will get marks for that. They can be helpful in getting work experience and applying for jobs. But the final degree you get from Oxford will be based on um, that the final two and a half years where you do a number of fixed subjects in part because of the uh, requirements from the regulators for legal practice require us to teach those specific subjects. And we also give you the option of doing specialist subjects on top of that in your, in your final year and from a whole range of topics, human rights law, family law, commercial law, all sorts of things you can do. At that point, you can start branching into specific areas because in, in the real world, it will generally be the case that you'll specialise in one or two areas of practice. Um, but at the start of your, um, your law training, when doing a degree, it's important to get on top of all of it so you now you know how all the jigsaw pieces um, fit together. Okay, method of teaching. Tutorials is the key. I, um, uh, Mindy said it, I've said it already, it's these one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two or three um, sessions that, that happen every week. 
and in fact, you have effectively have three every two weeks. So it's 1.5 a week. Um, they're quite intense, but they are a remarkably effective way of um, transferring knowledge to you and, and also transferring skills, uh, teaching you skills about how you can um, think for yourselves and, and navigate the legal material yourself, all the cases, all the statutes, all the secondary literature. Those are organized in college and they're supplemented by lectures given faculty wide where experts in the field will be giving um, you know, uh, their notes about understanding the key principles behind each particular topic. Now, one of the value of, of those lectures on top of tutorials is because law, unlike the sciences, is rarely, um, it's rare that there'll be a, a single right answer. Often there'll be debates over what the single best answer is. Um, there can be quite different perspectives to the same legal problem. Um, and it's, that's why it's extremely valuable to have perspectives through your, through your degree, not just from your own tutors and colleges, but also lectures across the broader faculty as well. And you can see both where, they, where your tutors and, and other lecturers agree with each other, where they, where they have slight differences of emphasis or focus. Um, that's something that you'll, you'll come across uh, when you go out to be lawyers. You'll see judges on the Supreme Court disagreeing with each other all the time. That's part of law. Um, there'll be um, parameters for the debates. Everyone understands the certain basic legal principles upon which um, we have to decide these questions, but you'll never get one answer to, to a legal question. And that's why it's so intellectually fascinating. On top of that, we do supplement the classes. That's reasonably rare, but occasionally we'll get you all together in your, your tutor or your specific subject to um, uh, go over a, a seminar format, an interactive format, uh, some of the key 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 revision questions we need to deal with in, in particular topics. Okay, so that's about Oxford. I'm now going to go into the application process, but you can certainly find out more information um, on college open days. Unfortunately, because of COVID, no, nothing's open in person, but there's definitely a lot of material on the websites. Um, and I would encourage you to look at, uh, do as much research on colleges as you can. So about applying to Oxford, um, I'm going to run through this um, uh, reasonably quickly, but essentially the key point, key takeaway points is the skills we teach you are also the, um, we want, we're looking for the potential for those skills when we're admitting you. We're looking for your reasoning ability, your ability to communicate effectively, and your application, your, you know, the extent to which um, you're going to apply yourself to the subject. As um, I said yesterday in the speech, if I could have a, a magic wand that could detect, to, to detect your, your work ethic, your willingness to work, that, was, that would be the thing that would be most important to me in deciding whether or not to admit you. Um, you, know, you can teach people how to reason, but it's very hard to teach people how to work hard. They either want to do it or they don't. Um, and the same with communication skills. It's, you know, it's, that is a teachable skill, but um, work ethic is, is something that, you know, is sort of innate to all of us. Um, okay. Uh, how, are we, how are we looking for those, uh, those particular skills and attitudes? We look at your school record. We look at your reference. We look at your personal statement in your UCAS form. We'll look at the national admissions test for law. There's a national test you must sit. And we also have interviews. Now, this is the point where I have to make, a, obviously, the COVID disclaimer that we fully understand that there's been significant disruption to your schooling um, uh, life um, and the way in which you've been assessed. That is something that will be taken into account by the university and by us individually when we're reviewing your applications. It's not the only... See, also not the only data point we do take into account. So the fact that your GCSEs will have been affected um, doesn't mean that we don't have other sources of information we take into account, including, for example, the LMAT test and the interviews, if you are shortlisted for an interview. Okay, admissions process, key dates, 15th October. And I'll come back to the exhibits because you can actually apply to up to five different universities. Keep, the key point is you can only apply to Oxford or Cambridge. You should basically apply to us and four other universities of your choice. Um, but I'll come back to that. The standard offer for us is three A-levels 
Um, three A's at A level. Um, if you if you are predicted to achieve that, plus you sit the L note, you're caught, you're entitled to throw your hat into the ring, and I would encourage you to do so because you have nothing to lose. Um, uh, if you if your teachers support you and I think you know you've got the potential to to, to do um, potential to succeed at uh, on a law degree, you're predicted to get three A's. You're willing to sit the LNAT, by all means, throw your hat into the ring. You have nothing to lose. There are slightly different qualifications if you're from Scotland, as I listed there in the second and the third bullet points. And if you're doing the IB, um, uh, we're looking for the minimum threshold is 38 or more points. Um, although in practice, you, we, we, we would usually expect you to get more. But that's the minimum threshold, again, entitling you to apply. Which college? I've already explained um, the choice. I just, again, encourage you to do as much research as, as possible on the colleges to sort of narrow down your choices. If you can't, at the end, work out exactly which one you do, you can always do any, mini, money, mo, rock, paper, scissors, whatever you want to do, um, or any, any way of deciding is legitimate. It really comes down to your individual preferences. Um, when you come to Oxford, for an interview, if you're shortlisted for an interview, you may end up being interviewed at multiple colleges and you may actually receive an interview from either, either of those colleges or indeed some other college and college you weren't even interviewed at. Personal statement, right, some advice. Um, a personal statement is important, but it is, it is not the most important part of, of your application. It's the part that you have the most control over. You decide exactly what goes in it and exactly what doesn't go into it. Because it's all about you, we want you to, we, uh, uh, the most strongest advice we give you is, is make it all about you. Um, you don't have to um, convince us that you've always wanted to be a lawyer from the moment you could talk. Your motivations for doing a law degree may vary. The reasons why you're interested in applying to the subject may vary. That's all fine. What we want to know is just what's your motivation for coming uh, to do a law degree. Obviously, in the personal statement, you don't even have to mention Oxford or any of the colleges because we'll be applying to different universities as well. So we're just interested in, you, in what it is about um, law that interests you. And, and be true to yourself, yes? It's, this is a point, and this is an important point about Oxford as opposed to some of the other universities. Whereas for other universities where you don't do an interview, you're essentially making a written submission to get in. Um, in the case of Oxford, you're making a submission to get an audition to get in, and an audition in that interview. And the significance of that is that when you write your personal statement and we invite you to interview, we can actually ask you questions about your personal statement in the interview. So make sure whatever you put in your personal statement, you're comfortable with it. If you're using any big words, make sure you understand what those words are because there'll be people at Oxford who will love to question you about the history of those words, whether they're Latin origin, Greek origin, Germanic origin, whatever the case may be. So you, whatever you put in the personal statement, be ready to explain it, explain why you've referred to certain books, for example. Um, don't refer to books if you haven't read them. Um, it's, this is really a personal statement where you, where you want to be authentic. It needs to be all about you. The key point is if you've had any personal problems in your, in your educational journey um, or even your life circumstances that made, made it hard for you in your studies, the personal statement is the place to flag them up. It's one way of ensuring that information gets to us. There are other ways of communicating that information, including through um, your referee statements, but the personal statement is the way of guaranteeing it gets to us. So I, we do encourage you to put it there if you can. Okay, the LNAT, go to that website and look at it because the LNAT is something that's still in your control. It's a test you have to sit. Um, it has a multiple choice um, uh, section and an essay section. Uh, the multiple choice section where we give you passages and then a series of questions based on those passages. And then an essay question where we give you like a one sentence essay question and you have got 40 minutes to, to write about it. Um, I do encourage you to go to the um, uh, LNAT website and look through the various uh, practice tests and try and practice as much as you can um, on through through that material, but also picking other questions that you might, for example, essay questions you could write about. 
the more you think about these sort of interesting philosophical, cultural questions, the easier it'll be for you to na na navigate the LMAT uh, when, you when it comes time to sit it. Um, we will mark your LNET essay, it will come to us, it will come to also come to the other colleges who, the other universities who, who use it in their application process. We're looking for um, uh, your ability to read text closely and your reasoning ability and your communication. Again, the same skills we're looking for. There are bursaries for the LNET if you need to, um, uh, uh, if you have got any difficulty in paying the fees to sit the LNAT. There are um, bursaries available um, to um, help you get through that process. And you, again, I, I encourage you to look at the website for that. Uh, the interviews under um, 50, just about just under 50%, probably a bit lower uh, of our applicants are shortlisted for interviews. Um, and if you do get into, uh, invited for an interview, your chances of them become better than one in three. All the interviews take place in December. Um, you'll get interviews, um, usually get interviews at two college, uh, two interviews at one college. Although in the case of overseas students, it may just be one, one Skype or uh, uh, electronic um, interview, but you also may get a further interview. It's possible, we'll have to wait for um, government guidance on COVID that the interviews this year happen online. So it doesn't matter where you are, everyone might, might be having an interview online as well. Again, go to this website to have a look. Um, I think um, uh, as an example of um, uh, what we're looking for in the interview process, the main point I would make is we are not teaching you on knowledge of law. Sorry, we're not looking for, for knowledge of law. So you don't have to go out and read legal textbooks to, to prepare. What we're looking for is your ability to think like a lawyer, think about problems like a lawyer, um, uh, think about your logic and reasons for, um, for supporting a proposition or arguing against a particular proposition. Can, can you see both sides of the argument? How, um, can you navigate your way through to conclusion, working out which you think is the better side of the argument? How precise can you be in the distinctions you wish to draw? That's the sort of thing we're looking at. So you don't need to know anything about law specifically. You can debate, and I encourage you to do this debate with your friends and your family and your, your grand, some, anyone who can't tell you to go away because you just want to keep, keep debating with them, different propositions. And it can be about anything. It can be about the legitimacy of COVID restrictions. It can be about um, the relationship between the UK and the European Union. It can be about making, how to make the Premier League fair, fairer. Anything that, which there are difficult choices to be made um, uh, and, uh, it, the rules about what, what would be fair and how people will respond to those rules. Those are the sorts of things that, that, that uh, lawyers are interested in and it will help you uh, become a good lawyer and the sorts of things we're, we're looking for in the interview process. Okay, last thing I'm going to say is, is Opportunity Oxford. Um, for those of you who do come from um, more disadvantaged backgrounds, we have a number of programs in place to try and assist you with your transition to Oxford. Um, and Opportunity Oxford is a, a bridging program that I've been uh, uh, organising um, for the last 12 months or so, where we, before you start your, your degree, we actually um, have a, a two-month course where we introduce you to the sorts of topics, the sorts of materials that you're going to um, come across in your degree to effectively give you a flying start. And it includes a, a two-month online course, which you can do in your own time, and then a two-week residential where we get quite, we do some quite intensive taste lectures, tutorials. So all the sorts of things you would end up doing in, in your degree proper, we do them at the two weeks residential, which is essentially a practice run. Um, all, all designed to give you a flying start. You don't have to apply separately to Opportunity Oxford. You just literally make the application and the university will do the rest. We'll work out whether you're eligible. We'll work out whether the, um, uh, we want to put you onto this course um, and of course the expenses associated with the course are paid for entirely by the university and you will get a um, small stipend to even do it so even if you have doing a job over the summer um, we will get, pay you a small stipend for those two um, for that period 
in order and when you're um, learning with us so you don't don't lose out. Okay, I'm going to finish now and hand over to Jeremiah. She's going to talk to you about how lovely it would be to spend at least one year in Europe, part of your law degree. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew, for the great introduction and uh, welcome everybody. I am Jeremiah Adams Prassel. I'm a professor of law here in the law faculty. I'm particularly interested in the world of work. So as a labour lawyer, I think about how technology, how various developments in the labour market are challenging our future at work, everything from zero hours contracts to the big judgment in Uber you might have seen um, a couple of days ago. I'm also a fellow of Magdalen College and one of my faculty roles is that I am in charge of what we call course two, which is our academic exchange program. And I just want to tell you a few additional things to what Andrew has told you. <laughs> so essentially, the big difference between course one, which is the three-year program Andrew has been talking to you about so far, and course two, is that you get all the same content in Oxford as course one, but you spend year three studying law abroad. So you come, you do law moderations, you do your second year, and then instead of moving into your third year, you take a break from Oxford for a year, go to one of our continental European partner universities, and then after that year, you come back and do your final year, again, exactly in the same way that Andrew has described. That's one small addition to what happens in your first two years, and I'll go into this in a bit more detail, is depending on where you go for your year abroad, we provide a certain degree of additional language and or substantive legal training as well, just to get you ready and up and running to move to one of our partner institutions. So let's start with the most exciting bit. Let me give you just a flavor, just an idea of our partner institutions and where you could go. So the first good news is that you don't necessarily need to be able to speak a foreign language to take a course two. For quite a few of our options, indeed the majority of them, we do require that you are able fluently to operate in the language of our partner institution, but that's not true for our exchange with the Netherlands. So for our exchange with Netherlands, Leiden University being our partner there, and the focus is very much on European and international law there, and the course is all taught in English. So if you're worried about not being able to apply to course two because you don't speak any foreign languages, don't, the Netherlands, Leiden is always open as an option for you. The next part of the institution, and I suppose here I have to declare my bias, I myself am a graduate of course two, so when I was an undergraduate, I joined course two, and I spent a year in Paris, studying at what was then known as Paris 2, now just known as Paris Assas University, one of the leading law schools in France. And that's where you would go with our exchange program there. This is one of the buildings you see there of Assas, um, right opposite, essentially where the picture is taken from is the Pantheon. So it's in the very center of Paris, um, a beautiful university. In Germany, we in fact have two partner institutions. And so the intake for Germany tends to get split between two cities. On the one hand, Bonn on the left-hand side, and on the other, Munich or München in the south of Germany in Bavaria. And again, two excellent, two of the leading law schools in Germany where our students can go if they are on course two. There's also an exchange program with Italy, um, with the University of Siena, one of the oldest universities in the world. Um, indeed, Mindy was telling earlier about how old Merton was. I wouldn't be surprised if Siena could rival Merton College in terms of how long it has been an educational institution. And we've got a number of places available for students to go to Siena. And then finally, um, the most recently added exchange is with Spain, where you can go to Barcelona at the Universidad Pompeo Fabra. Um, what I have to put on the slide there for you is a picture of their library, which I always think is a stunning building. It's some sort of old stables or, or storage warehouse. And it's just a stunding library. Um, the other bonus feature about uh, University of Pompeo Fabra is that that building you see there is less than seven minutes walk away from a beautiful ocean, which uh, is also quite lovely. Now, one important thing, and again, it's one just slight difference when it comes to the application process, is that we ask that you use the correct UCAS code. So rather than the standard UCAS code that you would apply just for the normal three-year course one law degree, the BA in jurisprudence, if you want to apply for law with law studies in Europe, you have to use the following codes. For the Netherlands, that's code M190. So that's Leiden. For France, for um, Paris de Assas, that's code M191. 
for Germany, um, for either Munich or Bonn. We only make that assignment later once you're already on the course. It's course code M192. For Italy, for Siena, it's course M193. And for Spain, to go to Barcelona, to Universidad Pompeo Fabra, it's M194. So just make sure you get those codes right for your application. What about language requirements? So as I've already hinted at, except for those who intend to study in the Netherlands, applicants must be competent in the relevant language. And normally that's with a grade A at A level or an equivalent qualification. I should also say that sometimes we get students who are native speakers in that language. And of course, if you're a native speaker or, for example, you have already studied in that language, say you want to go to Germany and you've got the German Abitur or you want to go to France and you're just doing um, the baccalaureat in, in French, then, of course, um, uh, we take that as an equivalent uh, qualification. I should also add, and the details may slightly depending to your course, that we do provide additional language classes in your first year and also introductory law courses in the relevant jurisdiction in the year before you travel. Sometimes that's split, so sometimes it's really one year of language tuition and then one year of legal tuition. In the context of other courses, we actually integrate the two over the two years. Um, the idea is essentially just to give you a bit of help for when you first enter the new system, that both linguistically, but also just in terms of understanding the basis of the legal system, you have got a well-grounded prior education. Don't worry about it in terms of the extra work. There's nothing like homework. There's nothing like weekly tutorial essays or anything like that. It's really designed to be in addition to um, your normal mods and, and FHS teaching, but without putting any unnecessary burden on you. And I can really tell you when you then turn up, uh, in your exchange university, it's extremely helpful to have had that prior training. Okay, so then I guess the question now is why should you apply for course two? <laughs> and I think I've got a couple of reasons for you, both academic reasons, um, but also I think more, more personal reasons. So in terms of academic reasons, I think it can be incredibly helpful for your intellectual development as a lawyer to be able to think about comparatively how different legal systems approach different legal problems. Because every legal system in the world has to deal with a series of basic questions. So in contract law, for example, how do we make, draw the difference between me making you a promise and me entering into a binding legal contract with you? In public law, what are different ways in which we can hold politicians legally accountable? Should it be through political mechanisms? Should it be through judicial mechanisms, the courts? Every legal system faces those problems, but also for a number of historical, socioeconomic, political, legal reasons, the answer to those questions are very, very different. And I think it's so interesting that once you've spent your first two years in Oxford, getting a really good grasp of how English law deals with a lot of these systems and a lot of these questions, then spending a year abroad, understanding how a different legal system tackles similar issues can be so interesting in terms of working out, you know, what do you think about the way English law does it, how to evaluate how a foreign legal system does it. It's incredibly valuable. Um, I think also in terms of jobs, Obviously, even if you don't have, uh, as we're practicing in both countries, it's really attractive. The vast majority of work lawyers do, particularly if you want to become a solicitor or go into a firm of solicitors, will involve an element of international work, will involve an element of international cooperation on big lawsuits, on big deals, etc. And just having a basic sense, a basic understanding of how another legal system works can be incredibly valuable for that. Finally, I should also add that Whilst we do put a lot of emphasis on the intellectual and the academic element of our exchanges, it's also great fun and really worthwhile living in another country for a year. Whether you've traveled a lot growing up or whether you've never been abroad, the opportunity of, of being fully immersed in a country, going somewhere not as a tourist, but really as a student, sort of living there, being fully immersed, making new friends, both internationally, but also from that country, is an incredibly valuable experience. And thinking about you know, spending a year, not just studying abroad, but also living abroad can be incredibly valuable and important. So all in all, I hope I've really convinced you that uh, you know, course two is very much worth your attention. Two more things to point out. 
The first one is in terms of the application, the application process is the same. The only slight difference is that in addition to your interviews you have, as Andrew's described, we will also conduct a brief language test. Nothing scary, nothing academically um, uh, difficult. It's some sort of comprehension and discussion exercise. Imagine being given a, an excerpt from a text or maybe a short newspaper article to read and then discuss it with a language tutor. Really, all we're trying to establish is whether with the additional support you'll get during your first two years in Oxford, you will then be able to actually successfully engage with life and academic work in our partner institutions. Also, it's important that unless you specifically tell your tutors during the interview that you don't want that, if you apply for the Law with Law Studies in Europe course, your application will also be considered for the three-year law course. So it's definitely a possible outcome that you apply for course two, but there aren't enough places in course two, so you don't succeed in your course two application, but you nonetheless end up on course one. Indeed, that's what happened to me when I applied. I initially applied, didn't get a place on course two, and then after law moderation, some additional places became available, and I then reapplied and joined the course at that point. So you know where shape or form harming your chances of getting into course one by applying for course two. The other thing I should point out, and um, I'm afraid we, we can't give you a lot of detail yet, um, one element of uncertainty hanging over course two are the implications of Brexit. So up until now, the course two was funded through um, a European Union scheme called uh, the Erasmus or Erasmus Plus regime. And with Brexit, the United Kingdom is no longer a member of that regime. There are alternative schemes being designed uh, by the UK government. We're working very, very closely with our partner institutions. Our commitment as a faculty to course two, as a university, to continuing our exchange programs, it's strong. And if you want to know the latest details on what's going on, I've put a website on there for you. And you see that I've highlighted in yellow on my slide, there is a tab specifically for prospective students FAQs. And as hopefully in the coming weeks and months, we get more details about the, how the scheme will specifically work how the relationships are going to look like, we will always keep updating that website. But again, um, I, that's the, I wouldn't let that uncertainty in any way, shape or form take away from your enthusiasm for course two. Um, if worse comes to worse, you can always, even if it's a course two, uh, drop out in due course and just enter a return to the normal course one. So if you're worried about the uncertainty, actually just keep checking back to that website. But overall, um, I would strongly recommend you apply to course two, and not least because you can spend a great extra year of your life, not just studying law, but also meeting lots of different people and exploring a different city and a different culture. That's it from me. Um, but for now, I'll just say thank you both to Andrew and Jeremiah for joining us. Thank you as well to all of you for coming, uh, taking the time and uh, you know being interested in it. And thank you so much, everyone. Good luck and I hope you apply. <laughs>